Good morning and happy Sabbath to everybody. I would like to study with you a subject which is entitled The Real Meaning of the Cross. Cross was utilized by the early Phoenicians to torture a malefactor, a high news criminal. And it was adapted by the Romans. It was adapted by the Romans to torture a person who is a very worst criminal, a slave who ran away from their master, and then using the cross is not only painful, but it will show the people who will be passing by that how grievous is the crime committed by that person. And the worst thing is that after three days, four days, five days, if that person will die, will die quickly, then he will have some internal hemorrhoids. He'll be dying slowly, slowly in the cross, and the birds will come and start to pick some parts of the body until finally that person will die. Do you think it is simple death if somebody will die on the cross? So when Christ was crucified in the cross in that one afternoon, there was a mixed reaction. There were mixed reactions of the people. First with the Greeks, the Jewish people, as well as to the disciples of Christ. So Paul, in his book, he wrote, what are the reactions of these different people? It says here, but we preach Christ crucified and to the Jews a stumbling block. Why it is stumbling block for a Jew when Christ was crucified in the cross? You know why? Pilate wrote a stamp at the head, at the pole, which is Jesus Christ, the King of the Jew. Do you think it is a good news for the Jewish people? Their king was crucified? So, according to Paul, Christ's crucifixion was what? Stumbling block. A king, imagine a king crucified. It will not be a good news for the Jewish people. What about the Greeks? And unto the Greeks, foolishness. Why foolishness? For a king to be nailed on the cross? What was that? It's foolishness. But what about for those who knew the purpose of the death of Christ on the cross of Calvary? What is that? What is the suffering of Christ in the cross of Calvary. It says further in verse 24, But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Why do you think that the death of Christ in the cross of Calvary is wisdom? Why do you think that the death of Christ in the cross of Calvary is power of God unto salvation? At first reading of this verse, this may seem to represent complete misunderstanding of the meaning of the power. The verse says that the death of Christ in the cross of Calvary is power of God unto salvation. But you will misunderstood. You will misunderstand why it is power of God unto salvation. It seems incredible that the power of God could somehow embodied in a person of a penniless, crucified Jewish teacher, wrapped in the gloom of that awful day of torture and rejection. It seemed unthinkable that the true image of the omnipotent God could really be the pale figure of a broken man dying on the cross. Calvary looks more like the symbol of the abandonment of God. 
a picture of total impotence and irreparable defeat looking at human perspective, right? And yet, which, was, which has changed more lives in this planet world, all the wars of this world, all the treats and blustering military power, all the conferences, all political speeches, all newspaper articles, all the resolutions of all societies under the sun, or that one sublime deed when God in Jesus Christ for his love to human race went to the cross. Brethren, it is a fact, it is a fact of history that by the extraordinary life-saving agony in the cross of Calvary, Christ's cross became his throne. From it, in generation after generation, he rolls a spiritual empire of millions of devoted followers. What is the secret of the compelling power of the cross? What is the reason for its drawing, melting, subduing power? Why it has become an irresistible spiritual magnet for great masses of mankind? There are many reasons. But this morning, I just want to tell you three important reasons why the cross of Christ is a power of God unto salvation. Number one, the cross presents a new picture of God. Why the cross presents a new picture of God? What was uh, the picture of God according to the Muslims? Who is God according to the Jews? Who is God according to the Catholics? Who is God according to Asians, to Buddhists, to Hindus, to Pentecostals, to Greeks, and to Romans? To the Greeks and the Romans, their gods were remote and untouchable, preoccupied with fighting and hunting and lusting and feasting, totally indifferent to the needs and suffering of ordinary men. The pagan gods were friends only for the strong, the successful, the beautiful, the wealthy, or the wise. This is the God of the pagans. But Calvary presents a loving God. It presents him as suffering, weeping, bleeding, agonizing God, stretching himself upon a felon's cross. God has beaten servant of his creation. Calvary is God rejected. God the outcast. God humiliated. God in disgrace, it is God coming so close to man that he shares his shame, accepts his handicaps, and endures his pain. It is God's feeling for man, taking man's place, receiving man's punishment, enduring the consequences of man's folly and sin. Notice Isaiah 53, verse 2 and verse 5. It says here, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form, no comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should des desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him, him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. If you understand these verses, what kind of God presented in the cross of Calvary? had no form, no comeliness. If we look at him, we don't have any desire to look at him. We look at in the cross of Calvary, mangled, bleeding, sorrowful, smitten upon, buffeted upon, 
And finally, they crucified him. But what did Jesus say? Forgive them, Father, because they don't, they don't know what they are doing. What was the greatest motivation why Christ presented himself sorrowful, disgraceful, unworthy of desire? What is his purpose? Why? In Romans 5 verse 8, it says here, But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Does anybody want to die for his enemies? What do you think? Scarcely for a good friend. Scarcely for a husband. Scarcely for a wife. For children. I remember the story of Cromwell, the dictator of England. One of his general committed treason. And you know what was the punishment? Hanging. So, one week before the hanging of this general, the wife went to Cromwell and shed her tears every day, crying in his presence, asking for what? Mercy. But you know what did Cromwell answer to the woman? He said, woman, stop crying. Cromwell's heart will not be touched by the tears of a woman. So went back home every day, every day, and finally on Sunday, six o'clock in the morning, when the bell will rung, will ring in the church. That is the signal of the hanging of this general. Guess what happened? Five o'clock in the morning, the wife of this person went to the bell fry and placed her hand inside the bell. And it was also fortunate enough that the man that will ring the bell was deaf and blind. So what happened? The woman placed the hand inside the bell. So as soon as this man started to ring, what happened? Did it produce sounds? Or what happened to the hands? Beaten up, broiled up, blood came out. And Cromwell, soldiers and people waiting outside of the ringing of the bell, did not hear it. So Cromwell went inside the church, went up, and somehow blood <laughs> falling down and it fell in his dress. Look at what happened. Uh, looking above, the woman was inside. And that's the reason why the blood came in, coming down. And Cromwell said, woman, come down. The, wo the woman came down. And she said, woman, when I saw the blood, I decided to forgive your husband. What do you think? Why the woman suffered? Who was that man to be hung? Her husband, right? Why? She loved the husband. What is the reason? Because they are very close. They were very close. He was her husband. What about Jesus Christ? Christ died for us because we are his good friends. Christ died for us while we were yet his enemies. And that's why in John 3, 16, it says, Therefore God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, the cross presented a loving God, a sin-forgiving God. Now, the second reason why the cross is a magnet that will attract people because the cross presents a new picture of sin. Do you think what was the idea of the people before about sin? Since the beginning of the world, man was worried about sin. Every one of them invented to get rid out, rid out, of, rid out away of sin. 
some sacrifice little children and virgin women to be freed from sin. Some paid out great sum of money thinking that their sins will be forgiven. Some will make long pilgrimages. Others will receive lasting to receive heavy wounds, thinking that the more pain they receive, the more they are forgiven. While majority of them don't know what is sin. Now the cross presents to us today what is sin really. In the book of John, first epistle, chapter 3, verse 4, it says here, Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. In 1 Corinthians 15, 56, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. And what is the wages of sin? The wages of sin is death. And what is sin? It is transgression of the law. Now, to get rid out of sin, what is the only thing we can do? We can do. Since we are a people whose right to be saved were taken away, the original plan of God to be uh, to be inheritors of his kingdom without sin, to live with him immortally without death was taken away from us because of sin. What is the presentation of the cross? What is the solution of the cross for the sin that is attacking humanity? In 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, it says here, And he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Who has the forgiveness of sins? Only the reform movement people? Well, do you think about this verse? Who has the right to be forgiven? Only the people of God? It says here, but also for the sins of the whole world. Everybody has the right to be forgiven. Since all are sinners and come short of the glory of God, how can we get out from the problem of sin? In 1 John 1, 9, it says here, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How long we will be forgiven? Does it take one month? Does it take one year? Does it take one day? Does it take one hour? Does it take one minute? How long? In that moment, if we, if we receive Christ, our personal Savior, that moment we are forgiven. How long, how, how, how quick one moment will be? Brethren, the promise of God is very sure and the solution of sin is already presented in the cross of Calvary. Isaiah 1.18, it says here, Come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Brethren, there's no kind of sin that there will be no forgiveness. The only sin that cannot be forgiven is what? It is the sin against the Holy Spirit. The sin of the Holy Spirit is believing that your sin has no more forgiveness. And this, that is the only sin that the Holy Spirit cannot work for you because you don't believe that you will have the forgiveness of sin. But all kinds of sins will be forgiven. Christ paid it, on the, paid it all in the cross of Calvary. Number three, the cross presents a new picture of man. What was the picture of man in the beginning when he was created? 
in Genesis 1.26, how are we created? Huh? We were created in the likeness of God, both male and female. So we are sons of God. And we are designed to be immortal. We are designed to know the will of God without force. But we are designed with willingness to obey all the will of God. But what happened when we disobeyed God, especially our first parent? When man committed sin, he became mortal, destined to die. He became slave of Satan. His holy nature turned to be self-motivated righteousness, as clean as filthy rugs, and his dominion was taken away from him. How does the cross present the new picture of you? the new picture of me. In the cross, since we are slaves of Satan, what was the effect of the cross in our slavery? The cross terminated the slavery of sin. How? In John 8.36, it says here, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. You remember that uh, president, uh, who was that president? Who fought against slavery in the United States of America? Huh? Do you remember that president? He was fighting and fighting until finally it cost his life. Right, brethren? But how did he promulgate it and make that law into effect? Of course, by signing the bill or the law emanci emancipating the slaves in the United States of America. That was President Lincoln, right? What did he use to sign that law? Of course, he used an, an ink. How did Jesus terminate the slavery against sin? What did he use? Did he sign an ink, using an ink? What did he use to approve that law against slavery of sin? In Ministry of Healing, page 89, it says here, With his own blood, he has signed the emancipation papers of the race. I remember uh, one uh, MP of Great Britain, Wilbur Force. He fights so much about the freedom of slaves in the British Kingdom. And finally he won. But not only that, all those slaves that was that were freed, that were freed by this bill, still they are what? They are still slaves. In what? In what way? They are still slaves in the power of Satan. The total freedom is when Christ declared it in the cross of Calvary. In the cross, the adoption documents were signed. It is another presentation of the new picture of man. Why there should be adoption? What do you think, brethren? Which is uh, good? Freed as a slave from Satan's dominion and become slave again in the dominion of Christ? What do you think? A slave can inherit property or not? So when Christ freed you, he don't want you to be a slave for him forever. Because he is preparing an inheritance for you. A slave in the kingdom of Christ will never inherit anything. He will transform you from slavery into sons and daughters of his kingdom. How? 
in First John three verse one, it says here, "Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not." So there must be transformation, brethren, from slaves to become what? To become sons and daughters of God. This is the new picture of you and of me in the cross of Calvary. Our high calling, page 53, it says here, True faith, the believer passes from the position of a rebel, a child of sin and Satan, to the position of a loyal subject of Jesus Christ, not because an inherent goodness, but because Christ received him as his child by adoption. Another, another picture that the cross had been presenting for you and for me is that in the cross, our Father found a ransom for you and for me. Because without during the ransom, we are destined to die. This penalty must be paid before the plan of redemption must be installed upon you and unto me. And you know, every crime has its penalty. Do you agree with it? In this, uh, in this world, in every country, they have some idea how, how much is the price of every crime. And some people can pay money, bail out, to go out free. But some crimes, what is the penalty? Death sentence. Some crime, the penalty is life sentence. But the worst crime will be what? Death penalty. Like... Uh, Arabian country like uh, you know Indonesia if you use drugs and if you sell drugs what will be the penalty of that death penalty and what was the sin committed by Adam and Eve in the garden of Eden what was the penalty death and this death not even the blood of the angel can pay it not even the whole angels will shed their blood can pay this crime of these first parents. You know what blood can pay? It is only the blood of the dear Son of God. That's why it was not easy for the Father to decide to send His own Son to die on the cross of Calvary. But because of you and because of me, and the Lord wants to present a new picture of man in the cross. He decided to send his son. And Jesus also volunteered to do it for you and for me. In 1 John 2 verse 2, it says here, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. In Evangelism 618, it says here, Every follower of Christ stands pledged to dedicate all his powers of mind and soul and body to him who has paid the ransom money for our souls. Who paid the ransom for us? It is Jesus Christ in the cross of Calvary. His blood will pay the penalty of sin to the second death. Do you believe, brethren, that the death of Christ is not payment for the first death? Why? Because whether you are good or bad, you will die. First death, right? But what was paid in the cross of Calvary? It is the second death. Second volume out two, Testimonies for the Church 210, it says here, Christ felt much as sinners will feel when the vials of God's wrath shall be poured out upon them. Black despair, like the pile of death, will gather about their guilty souls, and then they will realize to the fullest extent the sinfulness of sin. So Christ paid for you and for me the effect 
and the wrath of God in the second death. If you believe on him in John 3, 16, you will not perish. The word perish there is not this first death. If you don't believe, if I don't believe Christ, then we will die in the first death, and much more we will die in what? In the second death. That is the penalty because you don't believe. I don't believe the gift of God through the love of Christ in the cross of Calvary. Now, the cross also presents a new picture of man by installing the power in you and in me. Do you think that the death of Christ is finished when he died for you and he died for me? That is all? Your sins are forgiven? The ransom was paid? You are adopted as his children? That is all enough? Much more than that, brethren. The cross presented a new picture of you when the Lord installed that power in you. Why I say installing that power? Do you have that power? Do you have that power to obey? Do you have that power to stop sinning? We don't have. It is a gift. And that was given unto you right in the cross of Calvary. It says here in John 1, 12, But as many as received him, to them, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. In letter 79, May 7, 1903, it says here, By this power we may overcome our evil tendencies and so modify our imperfect dispositions that the will of God may be fulfilled in us. What is this power that he will give to you and to me? It says here in Faith and Works 101, And the pardoned soul goes on from grace to grace, from light to a greater light. He can say with rejoicing, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. The grace that Christ implants in the soul creates in man enmity against Satan. Without this converting grace and renewing power, man would continue the captive of Satan, a servant ever ready to do his bidding. You know, brethren, it is not enough that you are forgiven. Something must be given to you and to me. Much more than that, it is the power to overcome. And what is this power to overcome? power to stop sinning. It is the grace that will be implanted in you. And what is the role of grace for you and for me? It is a converting power. It is a renewing power. And it is a power to stop sinning. And it is the power to do, do, to do the will of God. Now, another thing that the cross presents to you and to me is that the dominion that was taken by Satan will be instilled to us again. It will be given to us again. We can see here in the book of Revelation 3.21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I am set down with my father in his throne. So what is the ultimate picture of you and of me at the end of our struggle. Yes, he will forgive you. He will adopt you as his sons and daughters. He will ransom you. He will give you power to obey. But it is useless if after the judgment there will be no reward. What will be the reward? And that will be the happiness of both the angels, God the Father and the Son Jesus, and all the redeemed, when we will be granted what? What will be granted to us? When we will be granted to sit with him in his throne, together with his Father. In Good Controversy, page 484, he asks for his people not only pardon, 
and justification, full and complete, but a share in His glory and a seat upon His throne. So what is our ultimate reward? It is the share of His glory and His throne. Now, brethren, what lessons we can get from the suffering of Christ in the cross of Calvary? What it meant for you and for me? And how can we appreciate the sacrifices of Christ in the cross of Calvary? Do you think you have part? You have something to do? I have something to do so that the suffering of Christ in the cross of Calvary will be effective in you and in me? What shall we do then? The medicine are right there, prescribed by the physician. But then the patient will not take the medicine. Do you think there will be healing? Not at all, brethren. You must take medicine are prepared, but we must take the medicine for our healing. So the grace of God will be given to you, but it will be effective if you will receive it voluntarily. The Bible said in Isaiah 1, uh, 19, it says there, 1, 18 and 19, it says there, if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. And if ye are rebellious, ye will be cut off by the sword. What did the Bible say? Come now and let us reason together. He will not force you. And in Revelation 3, 21, he said, I am what? I am knocking. Behold, I stand at the door and knock at your heart. What will be our answer, brethren? One day, a boy was playing in the yard. And somehow, a bird <laughs> dropped down some few meters from him. And you know what happened to one of the wings? It was broken and bleeding. And the boy was touched upon looking at the bird. He went inside, took some grains, placed in the hands, and came to the bird. He said, bird, look, come and take the grains. What do you think? The bird come closer and eat. But instead, the bird started to fly. And nearby the house was a lake. And since the other wing was broken, the bird has no stamina to fly. And somehow in the middle of the lake, what happened to the bird? It fell down. Brethren, Jesus loves us. But the love of God does not, what? Force us to love him. God is love. But the love of God does not lead us to, but the love of God does not, what? Lead him to excuse sin. He did not excuse Adam and Eve in the beginning. He did not excuse Moses. Nor he will excuse anybody in our midst today. He can forgive, but he cannot excuse. So the result will be ours, like this poor, bleeding bird. But if we appreciate and look unto Jesus, what will be the result, brethren? It says here, when we see Jesus, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, when we behold him in Gethsemane, sweating great drops of blood, when we see this, self will no longer claim more to be recognized. Looking unto Jesus, we shall be ashamed of our coldness. Our lethargy, our self-seeking, we shall be willing to be anything or nothing so that we may do hard service for the Master. Brethren, it is really hard to go away from our comfort zone. 
I understand. But if you love Jesus, what happened in our lives, whether good or bad, scarcity or maybe in rich in riches, in poverty, in good health, in sickness, if we see Jesus, what will happen, brethren? We shall be willing to do anything or nothing doing hard service for the Master. May the Lord bless us this morning and come into understanding the real meaning of the cross. This is my wish and prayer. Amen.